Hey everyone, this video is going to continue our colorectal theme and talk about ostomy types and considerations. So first, just getting our terminology down, what is an ostomy? And the easiest way to describe it is that an ostomy is an intentional anastomosis between some part of the GI tract and the skin. If you watched our EC fistula video, it's kind of like an intentional man-made endocutaneous fistula. So somehow you either bring up some bowel or a loop of bowel to the level of the skin and the contents are actually expressed at that point of anastomosis. And there's two main variables that you can classify ostomies within. So you can either classify by the type of bowel used to create the ostomy or the actual mechanical structure of the ostomy itself. And usually you describe an ostomy using both of these. And once you have these two variables, you know exactly what you're dealing with. So we're going to go into those more here. So first, the type of bowel. The two primary types of ostomies you'll see involve a colon, which would be called a colostomy, or the distal small intestine, or involving the ileum, which would be called an ileostomy. Now, why do you think these are the most commonly used sections of the GI tract? Well, if you're using an ostomy, which by definition diverts the fecal stream or the uh, stream of enteric contents from the GI tract out to the skin, uh, that contents leaving the body, it's not going to be able to be processed by any further parts of the GI tract. So the more distal in the GI tract that you can perform this diversion, the more normal function, normal nutritional absorption, etc., the patient will have. So the most distal part of the GI tract is, of course, the colon. So a colostomy is going to be your most physiologic ostomy um, versus the small intestine. If you use a distal aspect of the small intestine, you can at least get pretty good nutritional absorption, but it's, you're going to miss out on the function that the colon provides, which is primarily the reabsorption of water uh, and some electrolytes. So while ileostomies can still function and are actually preferred in certain situations, uh, you do tend to have more issues with high ostomy output, which can lead to dehydration if patients aren't able to keep enough oral intake in, um, electrolyte abnormalities, acute kidney injury, etc. For some reference, a typical colostomy might have maybe 300 to 800 cc's of output per day, whereas a small intestine might have more like 500 to 1500 cc's. So just much harder to keep up with the hydration in an ileostomy. And of course, um, as the ileum gets shorter and shorter, for example, if somebody has an ileostomy that keeps getting revised, they keep taking more ileum, maybe getting into distal jejunum, those proximal anastomoses can be really hard to handle because they just put out so much uh, liquid and uh, make it hard for patients to absorb enough nutrients and uh, fluids. All right. So then the other variable is the structure. And the type of ostomy structures that are most common are end ostomy. So for, for example, an end colostomy or an end ileostomy or loop colostomies or loop ileostomies, of course. And then there's other terminology for kind of the other situation. Some people might call it an end loop. Other people might call it a double barrel. But what are these things? So first and simplest would be an end colostomy. So if this is the skin and this is a loop of bowel, if that bowel, there's just one end of it that comes up to the level of the skin, this unsurprisingly is called an end ostomy of some type. Now, a loop, on the other hand, you have two ends. Usually these were the same end of bowel that got cut in half right about here. Now you have two ends of small bowel um, reaching the level of the skin, and that would be a loop ostomy. Now, an end loop or a double barrel, um, some people have slightly different definitions of these. I think the easiest way to think about it is instead of having one loop of bowel that then came up and got cut in half here in the center to create your two openings at the skin. Uh, for an end loop, you maybe had a segment of bowel and then you cut a chunk of bowel out. So this bowel goes away and then you bring this end A and this end B up to the skin. So in the end, you still have something that looks like this, but instead of these two sides having been right next to each other before, they were somewhat separated in the GI tract and now brought together in the same place in forming two barrels instead of a true loop. So hopefully that makes sense. Some other terminology that you'll hear around ostomies are things like a mucus fistula. And that is just essentially, if we have a loop of bowel, you have your proximal end here, so closer to the mouth, your distal end here, so closer to the anus. If you 
take out a section of bow. Now we have a proximal end and a distal end. Uh, you could, for example, bring the proximal end up to the skin, and that would be an end ostomy of some, some type. But you still have to do something with this distal end. And of course, we already saw one option. You could bring the distal end up here in some sort of end loop or double barrel configuration, or you could bring it up somewhere else completely on the abdominal wall. So if this is proximal and this is distal, then in this case, your proximal end would be some sort of end ostomy, whereas your distal end would be called a mucus fistula. And that's just because the distal GI tract creates mucus. So if anything comes out of here, usually it won't. It will usually continue to go in the antegrade direction. But if it does, it's usually just mucus. So that's uh, the terminology for a mucus fistula. The other option, if you have this sort of situation where you resect something, and you have these two ends you have to figure out what to do with, this is often done in diverticulitis surgery, is you can bring your proximal end up again as an end ostomy of some type, and then you can just leave this distal stump with either your staple line or oversewn in the abdominal cavity. And that, this end of bowel is called a pouch. Typically, it's called a Hartman's pouch, for example, and this is just kind of your uh, sigmoid colon, for example, going to the anus. And this works because the pouch is still able to decompress normally through the anus, uh, just the way normal stool contents would go. So again, um, a mucus fistula, this, these are all situations where you take two ends of bowel, uh, proximal and distal end around some sort of divided segment and have to figure out something to do with it. So one option is to bring it up through the abdominal walls of mucus fistula. The other option is to leave it in the abdominal cavity as a pouch. So what considerations do we have for choosing which type of structure we use? Well, an end, or maybe we'll talk about loops first. So a loop ostomy, um, the pros are that it's much easier to reverse. And you can probably imagine in your own experience and the experience of most of your patients, a lot of people don't like the idea of kind of pooping through a bag onto their do anterior down the wall. Um, and so everybody, pretty much everybody wants their ostomies reversed and loops are much easier to be reversed because if you picture a loop ostomy, you've got one end here, one end here, and all you have to do to put this together is just hook these two ends up. So you can actually do that with just a little local excision. You incise the skin around these, bring up both loops, hook them together, drop them back in. You don't have to do a big x lap incision. You don't have to do a big surgery in the belly. Um, and so loop uh, ostomies are much more likely to get taken down uh, than end ostomies because with an end ostomy, sure, you can find this one end, but then your other end is probably stuck down here in the pelvis somewhere uh, within a lot of adhesions, very hard to find and requires a much more major surgery to reverse. So that's a pro. If you imagine this is going to be temporary and you want to reverse it, a loop or for example, an end loop or double barrel sort of structure tends to make it Easy, the reversal surgery easier and less morbid. Uh, the downsides of a loop are that obviously if you have two things coming through the same fascial opening, that's going to be a bigger fascial opening than just with an end. Uh, so people tend to have more issues with prolapse of their ostomies or peristomal hernias. Um, but again, if you're going to be able to reverse it, uh, that's probably a consideration that you're willing to accept. Uh, some other considerations, sometimes it's difficult to actually bring up the ostomy through especially a thick abdominal wall in obese patients, and usually an end ostomy is going to reach more easily in those situations. All right, so we've gotten a lot of our terminology down. We've understood why we use either colon or ileum for our ostomies, and we've learned a little bit about the structure. So just briefly to talk about uses of ostomies, um, there's really two main uses. One is fecal diversion. And you're usually doing that because you want to avoid the fecal stream from going past some sort of high risk anastomosis. Um, and another example is decompression. So for example, if you have an obstruction, maybe an obstructing colon or rectal cancer, that you just need to decompress the bowel as opposed to um, do some other type of resection. Maybe you want to give them a chance to get new adjuvant therapy before surgery or they have metastatic disease. In that case, you might do an an ostomy, in this case, usually a loop ostomy because you want to decompress both ends um, to treat that issue. It's also important to consider um, whether you're doing this diversion temporarily or permanently. For example, if somebody has a sur surgery where they're never going to be able to have output through the anus again, for example, if you remove the anal sphincters, then you might have a permanent situation for fecal diversion 
versus a temporary, like if you're just protecting an anastomosis for some amount of time. So if you're doing a temporary diversion, that's typically going to be a diverting loop ileostomy or DLI is typically what we use. Again, that's just because the loops are easier to reverse and the ileostomy is usually easier to create than a colostomy. Whereas if you're doing a fecal diversion, you want to use as much of the GI tract as you can because this is going to be permanent. You want them to have the best GI tract function for as long as possible. So that's typically going to be an end colostomy. And decompression, the type of ostomy you use, really just depends on where the obstruction is. If it's in the colon, for example, and you have a competent ileocecal valve, um, then you're going to have to do some type of colostomy course. Uh, this is a little bit more that I wanted to get into in this video, but just to briefly mention if you have colon here, ileum here, if there's no reflux through that ileocecal valve and it's competent, then the only way you can decompress a large valve obstruction that's maybe backing up here is to do a loop colostomy, bringing up the colon. Because of course, if you brought up small bowel here, it wouldn't actually decompress anything. All right, so now we're just going to talk through a few quick uh, clinical scenarios, and I want you to think through what type of ostomy you think this patient would be best suited for. So in this case, you have a 68-year-old male that got an APR or abdominal perineal resection. Recall that this is a situation where you take out a distal rectal tumor and you resect both the rectum and the anus. So the patient has no anal canal after this procedure. Hearing that, that should make you think that this ostomy is going to be permanent. Um, so you're going to get want as much GI tract as possible, which should make you think colostomy. Um, and then since there's nothing distally, you've taken out the rectum, there's no benefit to, or no real even option to do some sort of loop procedure. Um, so an end colostomy makes the most sense here. All right, let's say that you have a 73-year-old female that got neoadjuvant chemoradiotherapy and is undergoing an LAR for rectal cancer. Of course, an LAR, that's another type of resection for rectal cancer, but in this case, you spare the anal canal. Uh, so you can do some sort of anastomosis here. They could have uh, normal bowel function in the future. Uh, but keep in mind, you're giving them a low pelvic resection and they got radiation to the pelvis before this. So that's going to be a high risk anastomosis after your LAR. So usually you're going to want to protect this for a time uh, while that anastomosis is healing. So you should be thinking that a good situation or a good ostomy for this situation would be a diverting loop ileostomy. Um, it's easy to create, it's easy to take down, and you are expecting to only need this for a short period of time. All right, and our final scenario, let's see, you have a 55-year-old male that has Hinchy 3 diverticulitis. Again, for review, Hinchy 3, that means purulent peritonitis. Uh, that usually requires urgent surgery. So you've gone in, you've taken out a chunk of colon, usually the sigmoid colon. So you're going to have your distal rectum and your proximal descending colon. And what are you going to do with these? Are you going to hook them back together? Are you going to create some sort of ostomy? Um, and the reality is there is no one answer for this. Um, a lot of the newer colorectal data is saying you can hook these two together in an anastomosis, your descending colon to your rectum, and then just temporarily divert that because that is going to be a high risk anastomosis given the surrounding inflammation from the disease. If you do that, then you'd want to do a diverting loop ileostomy. However, in that same situation, uh, if you don't think the patient's stable enough to get an anastomosis or it's just too inflamed or you don't feel like you have a good bowel to do that anastomosis, you might do what's called a Hartman's procedure, which would also be completely acceptable, where you have, again, your two ends of bowel that you need to decide what to do with. And in this case, you a Hartman's procedure is just bringing up your descending colon as an end colostomy and leaving your rectal stump there. Remember, that's called a pouch, in this case, specifically a Hartman's pouch. Uh, and those are two perfectly, I'd say, safe, board acceptable answers for this type of diverticular disease. But hopefully those situations give you some realistic uh, mental models of how you might take the considerations involved in both the type of bowel, so small bowel, primarily ileum versus colon, and the type of ostomy, primarily loop versus end, uh, and apply those to different clinical scenarios. These videos are for educational purposes only. Do not use them to diagnose or treat any disease. We'll see you next time.